Walmart is, as most of us are aware, known for those low, low prices. You can get your prescriptions filled there as well and get fitted for a pair of eyeglasses if you so choose. What about more substantial medical care, though? Would you go for that? Walmart has opened up clinics inside a handful of stores in South Carolina, Georgia, and Texas because, as Sarah McCammon reports now from Georgia Public Broadcasting, it believes there is money to be made in local... Sync has connected to your phone and is reminding you that 911 assist is set to off. Sectioned off with these foggy, opaque windows. Once inside, the clinic looks like a scaled-down version of a pretty standard doctor's office. A reception desk, a small lab, three exam rooms. For $40, you can get a medical checkup with a nurse practitioner. If you work for Walmart and you're on the company health plan, it's only $4. It shows the continued evolution of Walmart in the retail space. Roger Beam is the executive director of Wake Forest University's Center for Retail Innovation. He says Walmart is always looking for the next big thing. So how do you do that? How do you get more customers into the store? How do you increase the size of the shopping basket when they are in the store? And, you know, the, the answer to that lies in terms of getting more products, more services that customers are willing to buy when they come into the store. Walmart's done that before with banking and food service. Some stores already host walk-in clinics in space leased to local health care providers. But now Walmart is opening its own on-site primary care clinic. If you need more than a basic office visit, you can get your cholesterol checked for $8. A blood sugar screening is $3. Walmart's Senior Health and Wellness Director, Jennifer LaPerry, says the company has some ambitious goals. Because it's about establishing a new retail price in healthcare. LaPerry says Walmart has a track record of doing just that, with the $4 generic prescription drugs the company rolled out in 2006. That became uh, branded in the community. It, it caused numerous other pharmacies to follow suit. By owning the clinics, LaPerry says Walmart can control costs and the services offered. The company's piloting the concept in areas with high rates of chronic disease and a shortage of health care providers. So far, that's smaller cities in the South, in states that aren't expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. It's an obvious place to start, says Dr. Harris Berman. He's the dean of Tufts University School of Medicine. I don't think patients in Boston would go for this concept or in metropolitan areas, but Walmart is very much into rural areas. And I think there, there really is an acute shortage, and this would be seen as better than no care. But can Walmart deliver quality at such a low price? Had you asked me that question 10 or 15 years ago, I would have been horrified at the idea that a, a, a retailer was going to start delivering medical care. But now, Berman says technology makes it easier for nurse practitioners to stay in touch with doctors who will supervise them remotely. And, Berman says... We still haven't solved the acute problem of uh, access to primary care. Especially in rural areas. So he says it's time for new approaches to healthcare delivery even if that means getting a pregnancy test at Walmart. In Savannah, Georgia, I'm Sarah McCammon for Marketplace. Coming up, everyone sort of has someone in their family who's trying to hold on to those ways of the old, you know, um, but at the same time, you're raising kids in this homogenized sort of new society. Race, class, culture, and comedy in the new ABC show, Blacking. But first, let's do the numbers. Dow Industrials gave back two-thirds of 1% today. 116 points closed at 17,055. The Nasdaq dropped four-tenths percent, 19 points. Ended things at 4,508. The S&P 500 forfeited a half percent. That's 11 points finished at 1982. Continued worries about slow growth, this time in Europe. Partly to blame, financials had mixed reactions. Morgan Stanley unloaded four tenths percent. Goldman Sachs wiped out about a tenth percent. Those new rules on inversions we told you about earlier took a toll on companies in the midst of deals. Medtronic backed up nearly three percent today. Apple continued to ride the iPhone money train, picked up another one and a half percent. Bonds rose, but just barely. The yield on the ten-year T-notes dipped to two point five two percent. And you are listening to market. Marketplace is supported by Allianz, providing travel insurance and assistance to over 9 million Americans through its affiliated companies in the U.S. AllianzUSA.com. 
by Rice University's Jones Graduate School of Business, committed to transforming business thought through innovation, scholarship, and research. Learn more at business.rice.edu. And by Zillow, with homes for sale, historical pricing data, and photos all available on Zillow.com or on their mobile apps. Zillow, find your way home. It's Marketplace on St. Louis Public Radio. Help your future as well as St. Louis Public Radio's. Make sure future generations of public radio listeners have their own driveway moments while you enjoy the benefits of a charitable gift annuity. By making this very special gift to St. Louis Public Radio, you'll receive a predictable, stable income for life. To learn more, go to stlpublicradio.org and click Support. Support for St. Louis Public Radio comes from the St. Louis Rams Sack Packs, which include four Rams home games this season. Tickets at stlouisrams.com or 314 Rams Ticks. And Ameren, investing in energy infrastructure to keep this region's electric grid safe and reliable. More information is available at Ameren.com. Few clouds and very pleasant 73 degrees, clear and 56 tonight. Sunshine tomorrow and a high of 80. Right now it's fair and 72 in Quincy. As we continue with Marketplace at St. Louis Public Radio, it's 615. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdahl. There's going to be some new data coming out later this week from the Department of Education, the default rate on federal student loans, school by school, over a three-year period. If defaults are high enough, there will likely be consequences for the school in question, the mere threat of which has in the past given schools an incentive to make it appear that defaults are not really a problem there. Marketplace's David Gura explains. A college doesn't want its default rate to hit 40% a year. Nick Hillman says, 30% over three years. Hillman is a professor in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They eventually could lose access to not just their student loans, but also uh, Pell Grants and other types of federal aid, uh, which can rack up to millions of dollars depending on the institution. If the school is worried about its default rate, Hillman says, that institution will try hard to lower it. There's a lot of gaming that can happen and just really weak incentives uh, and, and penalties involved with current policy. Schools can push students to ask for forbearance or defer payments. After the government released the last data set on default rates, it penalized eight schools out of close to 6,000. Not that many institutions uh, fail to meet this test. Thomas Wico with the American Institutes for Research says a school that's worried about its default rate can also hire consultants for tracking borrowers who are at risk of default doing sort of briefings and trainings with students. WICO says a college that can't lower its default rate definitely has problems navigating the federal financial aid system. It's like knowing where the speed camera is and still getting it wrong. According to Jacob Gross, a professor of education at the University of Louisville, this highlights a bigger issue. I think a real um, important part of this debate is whose fault is default. Is it the students or the institutions? The federal government doesn't always consider a would-be borrower's credit risk the way private lenders can. In Washington, I'm David Gura for Marketplace. What do you do if